involvement or the role of the youth has been alluded to, but you know, it will be very important and very interesting for me to be hearing the views of the youth. Being a youth myself, this is a, a fan of peers, uh, and uh, I really look forward to the interaction and engagement that's going to be coming to you from, from this panel. And, and as important, um, I would like to invite every single one of you during the Q&A session to, to be uh, asking the relevant questions as well of this youth. It's, it's not often that you get a panel of this uh, quality, uh, of, uh, of, of really, this is what I refer to uh, as I was preparing for this session, as, uh, as a panel that is really shaping, shaping up Africa's future in a very positive manner. Um, so, you know, going ahead, I would like to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so this will be a three to four minute introduction, um, starting off with Rob. Thank you very much, Cedric. Um, no, no, first of all, it's an amazing privilege being here, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm Ralph Baumgarten. No, I'm not German. I'm South African. African. Um, I am currently in the final year of both my accounting and law studies at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, and since 2009, or well, since 2007, I've been involved with an initiative called Writers Young Minds, um, an initiative that aims to channel the hearts and minds of passionate young leaders in this country. Um, we have moved to Australia into initiatives that really has a positive societal impact. Um, and thus, first of all, identifying, um, inspiring and equipping positive, well, passionately young leaders to, to be positive change agents in society um, as peers sitting around. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, Gertrude? having me. Um, my name is Gertrude Kisongo. I am Kenyan born and Ugandan. Um, I recently just graduated from Cedar City Campus. I currently work for a German bank, the Goldman Bank. I'm very passionate about Africa and I think for me, um, I think of myself as an African child, so I don't like saying that I'm all Uganda. I am an African child. I love this continent and i um, looking forward to interacting with all of you and the panel. I'm Zamantu Mopalo, born, bred, butted in Johannesburg. Um, <laughs> I'm currently studying towards um, international relations, politics, and law at Wits University. I've done, I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship and leadership in media. Um, I'm, I'm in radio and I also represented South Africa in the United Nations uh, back in high school. Um, and I try to rope in as much of my passions. Uh, as possible in the work that I do. Thank you very much. Eric. Thanks. Um, I'm Eric Gorilla. I'm studying at the University of Cape Town. I've um, been there for, for a few years now. I'm studying civil engineering and economics. Um, I just had the privilege of coming back from the One Year World Summit in Zurich. And um, as, much as, as much as we can feel Africa rising, I think the sentiment there among the young people from 190 countries is definitely the very same. I think the world can feel us coming and having had the privilege of meeting and working with young people, people from the ages of 17 and up, um, I think we're definitely ready to take the continent and, the, and these countries to places that um, no one ever really imagined was possible. Thank you. Francis? Yeah, thank you very much, Cedric. So my name is Francis Eli, and I'm currently a student at the African Leadership Academy, um, a prestigious um, high school that seeks to develop the next generation of African leaders. Um, growing up, um, I've been very passionate about my community where I come from because it's what shapes me, it's what shapes who I am. But one most challenging thing that has always inspired the things I do is that Africa has been um, described as the home of challenges and problems. But within those challenges and problems, we believe that um, there is an opportunity to create new things, there is an opportunity that seeks to be um, uh, pursued. So uh, I'm so passionate about entrepreneurship and youth empowerment, and also about the fact that HIV and AIDS, drugs, and all these things are trying to eradicate uh, a, a very essential part of our population that can change this continent. And so uh, it's one of the things I'll be talking about later on. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so My name is Linda, and I'm from originally from Senegal, but I'm just in the African Leadership Academy, which benefits. I'm really passionate about education, and I believe that a great nation can only uh, be made by um, informed, educated, and empowered citizens. So I want to be a teacher, and as much
much as certain people can be skeptical about it, I would want to do it. <laughs> If my panelists would allow me, this is something that would, uh, we would typically not do. And that is to, to go around and just ask the age. Um, so we can get a sense of who's in this room and, and the amount of courage. Uh, and, 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 and then that could be intelligence. Um, each one of them has to be able to address the audience. So, thank you. Please. I know. <laughs> All right, without further ado, I would like to ask Rob to, to take us through his opening remarks. And uh, he will be discussing how do we inspire the youth of Africa uh, to be positive change agents uh, in this day and age. Rob? Thank you, Cedric. Um, Dr. Moyo, thank you very much for sketching the world at ease. Um, financial crisis, um, environmental crisis, leadership crisis. Um, yes, the world is overwhelmed with, with many social problems, but I believe that what is needed is not only knowledge and analytical skills, but, but really the, the mindset and the skill set to be a positive change agent in society. Um, Quite Young Minds is one initiative that tries to, to identify these positive change agents in society and, and try to equip them to, to really make positive social change happen in society on a daily basis. Um, change agents that, that really challenge the status quo as it is, um, that's forward thinking, um, that sketch positive scenarios about the future. It's difficult in this day and age, but I mean, the panel around me, it's, it's just talking to them prior to the session, they're alive, they want to they jump in, they want to get their hands dirty and want to do things, um, because there is opportunity. Um, and this is the, the change agents that we would like to, to see come through. Um, and yes, people that really articulate the, the positive scenarios about the future. Um, and hopefully the media will give us that opportunity to really do that. And I know that we need to step up more, um, but I believe that that these young change agents are busy doing that because there are many other very positive initiatives um, trying to do the same work. Um, but I believe that these change agents, not only in South Africa, but in Africa, I'm very, very well excited about the, the, the future in, in seeing how young Africans, Africans are going to collaborate together, keeping them the same agenda as the Study Development Chair might have and say, but what can you come up with? Um, and see how they can actually take things forward. And, and it really is these change agents that, that need to unite in a common voice that needs to, to lead Africa in the future. I think it's been said that the next year, well, what this, this continent and this country holds in really <coughs> is within the hands of this young leaders sitting here and them out, out there. It's within the hands of these change agents that really need to, to lead the continent forward. And thus it is very important, I think Eric will touch on it, is how do, um, how does this leadership get passed on among generations? Um, because we most probably aren't seeing enough very inspirational leadership, and we know we need to take the lead ourselves and make things happen. But I believe that this generation will make things happen. I've seen them over the past years. I've seen what, what young people are doing. Um, I believe that as, as Eric said, I mean, I think really there's something rising and, and something is going to happen. Um, because there's a mentality of bottom line, we want to make a positive difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Rob. It's, it's quite a privilege to be first an African, but then an African woman. It's, it's an honor. And you know how they say the work of a mother is never done? I think the work of a woman is never done done, you know, we, we're constantly doing something, we're constantly reaching out to do something. As um, a woman, we know that we, very soon, outside Africa, the world is aging. So everybody will be looking into Africa. And so the role of women right now is for us to look at, um, to take risks and look for other agendas that can help us lift Africa, and especially from a youth point of view where we can come out, where it's just not, not, not only us, but we're looking at it from a point where we can help Africa burst out and 
phrase, um, like Dr. Moyo says, channel that road that allows Africa to be looked at as the beautiful continent that it is. What Africans should do right now is that um, it's not oblivious to the fact that there's many women in Africa who are suffering, there's disease, there's poverty, um, there's lack of education, lack of education. Um, if I look at my background, um, knowing when I studied at CDC campus, we obviously, it just hits you, like, this is where she comes from. But it's hard work, it's, it's overlooking all the disasters that's happening around us that's going to drive us and make Africa a winning continent and bring out change agents, like Ralph is saying, who are going to drive this continent to places, Eric, that this world would never know, you know, this world is, that this world is not prepared. And, and so that's um, what I think the role of women right now is from a youth perspective. It's fantastic. That's inspiring. Thanks for, for that wrap-up and the role of young women and girls in society. Uh, we look forward to further discussions with that. Uh, when I was introducing myself, I mentioned that one of my passions is entrepreneurship. And before I even um, speak about it, uh, I'll share a little analogy. Um, my big brother and I tend to have a lot of conversations about the future of this continent and the economy and politics, um, the types of debates that we typically would have um, when we're you know, having tricks. And he was saying to me how he was reading a, a magazine. And in that magazine, they had this analogy where they were saying, a company C CFO is having a conversation with the uh, CEO of the company. And the CFO says, what if we invest in our people and they leave us? And the C CEO says, what if we don't invest in our people and they stay? And I think right now, <laughs> I think right now, um, that's where not just South Africa, but that's where the African continent essentially is. We're at a catch-22 situation. Do we develop young people um, and fear that they're going to leave and go to the Europe and the Americas of this world, or do we just let them be and they're going to stay in the continent? And I think, you know, a lot of statistics have been thrown around about youth unemploymentness. Uh, I mean, in some countries in Africa, it was high 70%. That's shocking. And that's testimony to how we're not being invested in and we're staying. And it's largely because we don't have a choice. We have to stay. I mean, in South Africa, if you look at the ages um, of young people between the, the ages of 14 and 24, um, you know, unemployment rate sometimes was as high as you know, 60%. That is problematic. So then we need to be having conversations about how to alleviate um, youth unemployment. And I think the biggest thing, and it has been mentioned again throughout this forum, is entrepreneurship. I mean, education is not enough. I mean, I'm a student and I have a triple major. But the reality of the education system that we're in, in today's world, even from a global scale, is that we're being taught for degrees that we're not going to need by the time we graduate. That's how rapidly the world is globalizing. That's how rapidly you know, economies and markets are growing. That by the time I get my piece of paper, I might not be able to use that to apply for a job. Graduate unemployment is on the increase. I mean, we've even seen reports, not just in Africa, but in the UK, where a lot of graduates don't have, can't find jobs. So when you look at the comparison between our generation and the older generation, you find that when you had that piece of paper, you had that degree, they could get a job. We're not guaranteed that job. I can go up to PhD level, I might not be guaranteed a job. So then the question does become, how do we ensure that um, there's growth in various, um, in various countries' economies, but that growth also brings about employment? Because I think if you have growth and you don't have employment, then it just isn't good enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> May I say that I'm sure after the session uh, that you'll be guaranteed A number of ideas that are floating around and kind of transient, um, but I think that are much more fundamental than we've had time to discuss this morning. I think, firstly, um, any development um, needs to be human centric. I think the idea that education is something which is um, there to bring people to the point where they contribute economically is not necessarily a viable way of looking at the whole thing. I think that the human beings are naturally enterprising, and I think a much broader focus on human development, human capital development in Africa, uh, will bring us much closer to the long-term goals uh, that we would like to see. I think, um, I mean, a, a good example of development and, and investment is not broad-based, I mean, in South Africa, a number of companies in the financial sector have grown by hundreds of percentage points, but they've shed jobs in their labor force. 
Um, so the, the development of the, of the indicators we use are not necessarily um, broader based. And I think, in moving towards the future, I think that the, the youth need to exert themselves um, in a far more serious fashion. I think the young people need to recognize their role. I think they need to recognize the fact that statistics, like the one that's been mentioned this morning about 60% of the content being that young, I think that's a big responsibility. And we take ownership of that and, and move towards taking control, and social control, economic control, and eventually political control. Um, but we need to understand that this is a serious, uh, this is a serious uh, objective. And that in order to get there, we need, as young people, we need to take ourselves far more seriously uh, than I think any, any previous cohorts of young people have taken themselves in our pursuits of experience and our pursuit of education, um, in the way that we see ourselves in our own society as opposed to people who have the luxury of waiting a number of years before we get to the point where we can actively contribute. And I think that if we are to see in the longer term, uh, in closing, um, <laughs> if we are to see the a renaissance in Africa, I think we are the precursors of it are being, uh, are made, being made visible. I think the foundations are definitely there. I think it's necessary to stop thinking in a way um, that was necessary in the past and start thinking in a way that's necessary for the future. And I think this is where young people have a critical and fundamental role to play because we have a very, very different paradigm and way of seeing the world. And I think that in a, we should move towards a way that it will require courage. Um, as young people, we often feel as though we should wait until we are tall, we wait until we can see a framework where we can put ourselves in. And I think it's, we can start thinking in a way that um, will move us towards inspiring hope. Not only in the minds of investors in Beijing or in Washington DC or in Europe, but hopes in the, in the hearts and minds of the millions of Africans who are fundamentally sidelined and find themselves at the margin of the development of Africa. I think that's the most critical, crucial thing, and I think that's the role of youth. I think that's where we will find our niche you know, in the new global market, in the new global world, as we see it today. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, and, and again, I could listen to you speak for hours, but I think when you talk about taking over political leadership, uh, I heard Professor Mutambara lose a few kilograms, so it needs to be practical. Thank you very much. So um, in, not, in not so long ago, history of Africa, we have seen young people actually liberate or take part in the liberation of Africa from colonialism, from apartheid, from um, racial segregation and all. But I think that the current youth have um, the ability and potential to liberate Africa from issues like disease, issues like corruption, and of course poverty. But one very important thing is that Africa has been um, in, the, in, in, the, in the way of dealing with African issues, we have been more reactive as opposed to proactive. We look forward to treating symptoms as opposed to root causes. For instance, um, in, in, in my history of trying to fight <coughs> HIV and AIDS, especially when I was still in primary school, um, like I mentioned, our community was a low-income community. I don't think the problem at that time exactly was AIDS, because when we started out, it was an AIDS awareness club. We're trying to sensitize people about HIV and AIDS, but we forgot what exactly leads to HIV. Why are young people getting infected? And we realized that the main issue was we are coming from low-income families, and these guys are taking advantage of the girls and giving them money so they can, of course, uh, sleep with them or so. And the boys were also running out of school because they didn't feel valued, they didn't feel like they had a future. No one was actually telling them they need anything in the world or they can be capable of anything. So what we did was to try to empower them. How did we do that? We were like, okay, fine. We're going to start a vocational skills uh, um, program where these people are taught to earn what they, they have. So a main problem that Mr. Mutambara mentioned was that um, values cannot be legalized, but they can be taught, which I very much agree with because um, you, you cannot legislate values. You cannot legislate people to tell them, fine, you have to love your neighbor or not. But of course, the value that at the values that are taught in schools do matter, and that's why one of the things I wanted to talk about is the educational system that we have in Africa. Does it empower us to be self-sufficient? Does it empower us to have value in ourselves? And does it make us ready to take charge of the continent that uh, we're trying to build prosperity for? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? Um, I was asked this question. Um, how do you get Africa's youth to low pay work such as teaching, nursing, or um, police working? 
I mean, it's a tricky question because as much as these jobs are vital for a nation, they're also the least remunerated and the least rewarded. Um, so I want to take the example of a friend of mine, Timoni, she's Nigerian. So he, when she was young, she told her father, I want to be a teacher. I'm, I'm so sorry I can't do the Nigerian accent, but it's really funny when she does it. <laughs> but he basically told her, where do you want to put, where all the money I invested in you, how are you going to do with that? And she's like, but I want to help more people be educated and stuff. It didn't work out. Now she wants to become, I don't know, economist or something? <laughs> but um, there are incentives that motivate us to pursue a certain career. And among those are the ones that get us to the top of the Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. So as much as it's, it's nice to have a good salary and to make a lot of money to make people happy, um, there is this ultimate fulfillment, psychological, the reward for knowing that you've been teaching, that you participated in making a CEO or a president or just anyone. And to know that maybe you cured someone, you saved someone like by treating a, a wound normally. I think that's um, a fulfillment that is necessary to anyone's life. You don't want to be living your life and at the end of the day realize, yes, I have all this money, but then how, what do I do with it? What have I done? What impact have I had? And I think young people are not necessarily asking themselves those questions because they want to make money. It, it seems like when you're 16 to say, and 50 years I'm going to be driving a BMW or whatever, but I'd, I'm not expecting anyone at that point of time to be, to be saying, I want to become selfless, I want to be a teacher, because it's just, it's hard to think. But still, there should be some awareness um, campaigns made in school and universities to teach people about the work, the amazing work these people do, the amazing work a teacher does, um, the amazing work a nurse does, or police, how, how, put, how protected you are when a policeman is around. And, um, yeah. And I think it's, um, it can only happen long, with long-term solutions. It, as much as <laughs> she said, we, uh, we are a microwave generation, so we want everything to happen now. Education won't happen now, unfortunately. It has to take a long time. And, um, and to, for this argument, I would like to take um, the job characteristic uh, framework by a, a psychologist named Hackman. He says, when you are ha when you are working, when you have a job, there are four characteristics that make you stay in that job. Basically, these are the task identity. So, what's your job? What do you do? And you know, this has significance. How related are you to the job you're doing? How much fulfillment are you getting out of it? The autonomy. How creative can you be with your own work? And how much can you, let's say, um, be responsible for the outcomes of your work? And I think this is lacking in many of those jobs, particularly in education, where certain um, education systems restrict teachers. They are restricted to follow what's in the textbook. They're not, they're not being creative with it. So being a teacher, for example, in Senegal would be quite boring sometimes, quite tedious. And I think to be able to um, push uh, young people to become teachers and so we have to reform such of, some uh, of our fundamental institutions. Institution. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, audience, that's uh, a presentation from every single one of our panelists. Um, so what will be taking place over the next 10 minutes or so will be an engagement amongst the panelists themselves. And uh, thereafter, I will open up the floor to, to, to the audience to ask questions. Um, just for you, Eric, uh, you talk about a leadership philosophy for Africa. Um, tell us more about it. How do you impact? What does it mean? Because we are accused of being extremely theoretical at times in the things we do. What is that? I think the, the first thing uh, that I found interesting this morning was the fact that human rights wasn't very kind of high on the topic of discussion. I think as a, as a young person growing up um, in South Africa, um, we know that this is a big issue on this continent. Um, and for that not to be centric in the way we think about pretty much everything um, is an interesting idea, I think. 
And when I say a leadership philosophy um, on the African continent, I mean one which is not adopted. I think Africa suffers from uh, a very interesting, very recent, uh, very difficult history. And to think that we can just carry on business as usual and just kind of invest in our different areas and, uh, and adopt our neoliberal market trendy policies and that kind of thing and think everything will be fine in the long term is not necessarily correct. I think we have to be far more conscientious in the way that we think about our history. Um, we, have to, we have to consider the fact that in South Africa, for instance, you have a majority uh, demographic with minority power, um, political power, but not economic power. And you have to understand that the, and I'm oh, sorry, I'm using South Africa, because it's, the, it's my context for the book. Um, so your whole economic paradigm is defined by the group with majority interest, which happens to be a minority um, with an interest in history. In this particular country. So you can't, we can't act as if business as usual will be okay. We can't act as if kind of transformation targets um, will transform the system because they won't. Because if you, if you have kind of small pockets of people with a different kind of thinking, and someone mentioned earlier about their mother inculcating a set of African values in them. I mean, when that when a person with those kind of value systems enter the workplace, they think differently, so they have a different approach. But if there's one person like that, and 50 to 20 people who were educated in 1960 South Africa. I mean, what are you talking about here? I mean, nothing's going to happen. The person will likely be either be marginalized or they will have to adopt the operating paradigm. I mean, Steve Deco spoke about this when he wrote about black consciousness and all these different elements. We have to understand that all these different things feed into everything that we do, uh, whether it be in the economic environment or the leadership environment um, or the developed environment, uh, all these different areas. And I think to the problem is, is that our current paradigm is defined by kind of an adopted vernacular. Uh, we use words and things which couldn't originate there. And I think we have to be far more assertive about things that develop there. Um, I mean, Ubuntu was mentioned this morning. Um, that kind of thing has to filter into our narrative and into our thinking. Otherwise, what are we really doing um, in the longer term? Thank you very much. Just, just taking that, that very same question and phrasing it slightly differently, um, and here I'm coming to you, Linda. Um, I'd like to ask you, you you've got a French speaking background, so do I. And you tend to find that, just looking at this panel alone, uh, five out of six are English speaking, or Anglo, and one is French. Uh, so this division that I'm talking about, or this lack of integration, the integration is I see it between Francophone English or Francophone Africa and Anglophone Africa is a real thing. Uh, what has been your experience? Um, so basically last year I couldn't speak a word of English and I went to the African Leadership Academy and it was Amazing. quite hard because there are certain times you feel like saying something and you say it wrong or you don't say it at all and it's quite oppressive but then you get over it because you have to speak English. You want to survive. <laughs>
and it was a summit, a conference rather, a modern United Nations conference where there were over a thousand delegates. My particular debate was at the General Assembly and, um, and it was a session on HIV and AIDS um, in the African continent. That's what the session was all about. And so many young people who are not from the African continent really did have misconceptions about it. I mean, throughout the conferencing process, there were times when we were taken to American schools, and some of them literally thought Africa is a continent. And these are young people in America, or they think, you know, it's this one big thing and you have a giraffe as a pet. And, you know, I, I found that so rough because we email, we email our American counterparts, we tweet our American counterparts, how do you begin to think that we're not as technological as you are? And, and, and I also find it a bit, you know, sort of disappointing that that's the viewpoint they have. I think Africans, we are more open to what happens out there in the world. We are more open to um, the continents in the world. I mean, I knew all the continents in the world, I think, as early as three. You ask an American child who's probably even my age, they may not maybe be able to name all the continents. So that's very problematic. So I think that there definitely needs to be a shift around how Africans are perceived from other young people in other countries outside of the continent, obviously. Well, that's all I can do. Thank you very much. Rolf, enough talk. How do you change that? How do you change that? Practically, changing it. I think it's been said this morning, and there was a little bit of a debate going on here about agenda for Africa or agenda for African countries. Um, but I believe that it is necessary to, to have an African agenda that we can work towards because it is an Africa perspective that's out there, it's not necessarily only a South African perspective um, that's been carried around the world. Um, and that will only happen with immediate regional integration um, and making sure that we just start doing it. Um, I think we really make it so difficult for ourselves. Um, we in Africa love to talk, <coughs> we overthink and, 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 and we don't act enough. Um, and I really, I mean, and that's what I've been seeing with, with this new generation coming. They just want to do. That's what I said in my opening remarks. They want to get their hands dirty, but they want to know where can I also do it. Show us the opportunities to do that. We want to do that. Not because we necessarily want to be the billionaires of the world, because this continent needs us to act. It needs us, and we know we need to take responsibility. Um, and, and I think it's very simple. We need to take it. We've got the natural capital. Let's use that to build our human capital. They show the rest of the world that we can innovate, that we don't necessarily need to go through the industrialization process and they clean up our dirt afterwards. Let's show them we can build human capital while, while we can use our natural capital to build our um, um, human capital in a sustainable way. We've got that opportunity. Let's do it. Let's just do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The reality is, even though we say we are Africans, we're passionate and, and all that, the truth is, at the end of the day, we're responsible to yourself, you know? When we want to think Ubuntu is, you know, I am who I am because of who you are. And the truth is, if I'm not doing anything to better the continent, then if it affects me here in South Africa, it's affecting the same other person in Nigeria in the same way. So what, what we're calling out is for, I assume the, our elders, and I say that very cautiously, <laughs> our elders to, to come out and show us, to prepare us for what we call in our future, because we will be living there. We are the ones who are going to be sitting there. Next, you know, in 10 years time, we're the ones who are going to be looking up like this, and looking at the youth and, and thinking, hey guys, tell us ideas. So we're calling upon you to give us ideas, to open doors for us, to, to suggest to us that this is what you can do if you're, if, you're, if you're interested in education, if you're interested in just becoming a teacher. We're looking for that because we feel we're able, we're willing, we're dying to do it. We just want that small flicker of light to go through. And, and the elders, and with all due respect, um, and they don't necessarily understand the following: that the next generation doesn't. It's not about 
what, what's in it for me only. Because they know they have the responsibility of carrying this continent forward. And through whatever they do, they need to be sustainable. And business won't be business as usual in the future. You have to think, I mean, how is it going to affect my environment? And how is it going to affect the people in that community? Um, and so that's the way we think. It's not necessarily, we want a bigger salary. And, and that's what people need to realize. We just want to do, act, and make things better because it needs to happen now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Going on to helping fundraising for the Ghana School of the Deaf. And just all these things I've done, I've realized that it's young people and everyone else, it's not just social entrepreneurship, I'm choosing to call it entrepreneurship for social change. Because the problem with social entrepreneurship is that people become beggars. And, and that's what Africa turned out to be. People are keeping on going out to the Western world and saying, we need aid for this, this, and that. But I'm saying entrepreneurship for social change because I'm saying, why not start your business to actually solve a need? Because I believe, and now I've been taught at, uh, in my entrepreneurship class that needs-based innovation creates an abundance mind, my mindset. Meaning, if there's a transport issue, there are different ways you can tackle that problem. And that way, you're going to create different uh, um, ideas to solve it. And so I, I think really that the, the private sector, when we talk about branding Africa and the image of Africa, the governments haven't done the best job. We all know that. But of course, the private sector can do a lot. Um, I, I, I had, we had an opportunity to listen to Dr. Mwangi, he's the, the equity bank CEO, and he was telling us about the role of equity bank during the post-election violence in Kenya. And they did a great job to put the government and say, guys, we um, are a big service provider to like over 70% of the population uh, of the population that have bank accounts. And we are saying what is happening is not right, so this is what our ideas are to solve the problem. Um, people talk about CSR, okay, fine, corporate social responsibility, that's business and stuff. But one most important thing about what I think about corporate social responsibility is that service itself. It's the first biggest component of corporate social responsibility. How, why is it that the roads that are constructed in some African countries are repaired every other year? It's because someone is not doing their work right. So where is the work ethic, where is the, the corporate social responsibility that they are talking about? And um, finally, social entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship for social change can only happen if people are groomed to be that. For instance, Nelson Mandela and all the leaders we have did not just become leaders. They, their experiences or their circumstances made them as good leaders as they are. And we are saying Africa now has the opportunity to be in charge of the outcome. You, you, we have young people that go to schools, but how are you shaping those young people and what do you want them to become? Not, not just giving us, because the curriculum that is in Uganda has been the same curriculum for the past, I don't know, even 40 years or more, and yet times are changing. For instance, I cannot, in the Uganda curriculum levels, I cannot do history and mathematics. But right now I can do history and mathematics, and then it's relevant. And then also theory, we do too much theory in school. Where is the practical? When I was in high school, um, when I was doing all these initiatives, some teachers would tell me, hey, aren't you wasting a lot of time? You should be doing more of the studying than, than doing that. But at ALA, there is actually a system that allows me to run a, a business on campus, and at the same time do my levels. That way, I'm being, I'm practicing to be a leader, I'm practicing to be an entrepreneur, I'm facing challenges at this age. What then will happen to me 20 years down the road with all this experience? There's definitely going to be um, um, good ideas coming out. In the next five minutes, can I invite the, the floor to ask, let's say, three more questions? We'll start on that. We've got a lady in white. We've got another lady in pink. That's two. So the lady is actually. Right. We'll take two, two questions. Thank you. Um, I'm Bonolo. I attended uh, the One Young World Summit as well uh, this year in Zurich. And I love what's happening. I love to see young people on stage, you know, talking youth issues, talking African development. But I have a request for all the young people in the room today. 
Um, you know, what's happening right now is that there's a sense of, you know, how when you help the community, it looks like an achievement these days. It looks like, wow, there's a young person, you know, who's, you know, part of an initiative or who's starting a project to uplift, you know, their community or other young people. And, and things like that shouldn't be an achievement, they should be a norm. And I'm just asking that as young people, we, we step away from wanting to become that select few that's making that change. It attends things like Brightest Young Minds. Uh, excuse me, you don't know this. Um, that attends things like One Young World, that comes to Brand Africa conferences. Could we not be those young people who want to exclude ourselves and become those change agents, you know, like 10 of us, 15 of us changing, you know, Africa and how it's seen? And could we um, uplift other young people, um, get other young people to think the way that we're thinking? We obviously know that Africa needs, uh, you know, needs reco reconstructive surgery. We obviously know that there's so many things that we need to do. And we can't be that, you know, group of 20 people doing that or creating that change. We talk, uh, you know, His Excellency, uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe, spoke about success. Are we successful? We at university, we pursuing our degrees, we have our own hustles, but like, there are <laughs> other young people out there who also need to be enlightened. And we can't just keep that for ourselves. We can't just be those young people who, who are going to be trendsetters and look nice you know, in the global community and attend these things. And it's going to be like, oh wow, you know, that's a great, nice African young person. But what about the, the young Africans at home? What about the South Africans in various communities? You know, I'm from PE. There are many other young people that need to be uplifted in the Eastern Cape. And so let's just think about that, you know, and actually just you know, pay that forward, pass that on, so that other young people can be part of this change and be those change agents that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Tanyane from the Gold Project and One Young World. Uh, my question is, um, we are, it's actually related to what she said as well. Uh, here we are as young people sitting here and discussing uh, possible solutions for young people sitting in the rural areas, people who are marginalized, I mean, they're unemployed, the spirit is deteriorating. Um, so basically my question is, um, what is, how do we, how do we bring them to a level where we are? And how, how do we move forward in terms of what kind of um, initiatives do we need to implement in order to make sure that they too are not, um, to make sure that, I mean, they come to a level where we are and that they're not, I'm sorry. Um, I just feel like they're just at a more disadvantage. We, we, we like to talk about them and discuss them and their problems. When do they get to have a voice? When do they get to say, this is my solution for my problem? When do they get to be, um, um, sorry. Yeah, that's my question. Participate in the discussion. Anyone wants to take yeah. a look? Oh, okay. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very brief, very brief. Um, so, Linda? Ultimately, it comes back to thinking from my passion, right? You want to form, you want to make entrepreneurs that can go out and make other entrepreneurs. That's what I believe, and that's why my project basically is an intensive entrepreneurship program that goes into very rural areas of Senegal and teach people just how to see different, just how to think outside of the box. You do that, you don't even need to give them, uh, teach them the alphabet or anything, just teach them to think outside of the box, and that's it. They come up with amazing ideas because they understand their problem more than anyone can do, can do it for them. So that's why I believe we should train entre entrepreneurs that go out and make other entrepreneurs. Thank you. Francis? Yeah, um, so many successful people in our country um, are from maybe hard sand backgrounds and they've faced challenges. But what are you doing to go back to your community? What are you doing to be that inspiration? So if you can go back to your community <coughs> and tell your story and your struggles, then I'm sure more young people will be impacted. And personally, what I did was start um, the Young Entrepreneurs Challenge, basically get those young people to identify problems in their, in their communities and find solutions for them, and that way they can move on. So we need role models, and that's where the elders come in. You should come and be role models and be willing to speak 
to your own schools and to your different communities that you come from. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that uh, Bimolo brought this up. Uh, and you know, as you're speaking, my brother and I like to call that it's a sensitivity principle where we're attending varsity and you want to live in your sanctions after you graduate and live the champagne life and you've made it and that's pretty much it. And then Tanyani spoke about how we finding solutions for them, these young people who are from rural areas of townships. But I actually, you know, differ. I'm from a township in Lady Soweto. I think I'm one of the only females who who isn't pregnant, who's in varsity, you know? So I'm one of the them that we speak of. And I know that similarly, you said that you're from the Eastern Cape. You're also one of them. So the reality is we are going back into our communities and bringing about the change. So we shouldn't think that attending these forums suddenly makes us any more exclusive. If anything, we're trying to leverage the fact that we know what our background is and trying to you know, partner up with people in the private sector who do have the power, and that's the reality. So if I'm sitting and I say, this is my project, they've spoken about this, and I want funding, or I want resources, I want to shadow a CEO, I want to shadow a mayor, and I go up to him and say, listen, this is what I do, how can you help me? So we must not forget what our role is in these global platforms that we have now. So we need to go out there to the people who are already here, the older people, and say, you've got the knowledge, you've got the skills, I want to shadow you, I want to learn from you. And that's what we we can bridge that gap. Thank you, more power to you. Mm. Final comment is because you want to share to her, but something practical that I'm enjoying, you know, you know, you see us here speaking at the Globe Forums, you know, the um, Brighton Lines, you see us here and you assume that these are the people who've gone through life and had it easy, you know. I'd like to be proud, really, because the one practical thing that you can do as a person, and I'm sure everybody does it, and it's mentorship. It's mentorship. You can go to those communities and you can pick that girl from wherever she is and you can sit with her and you can encourage her. And if it means you going there monthly, once a year, taking her to school primary and just educating her with simple basic maths, you're doing something. Thank you very much. I'm taking two more questions. So the lady standing up and uh, Jackie, so you have that. Um, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kenene. I was once a youth as well. <laughs> <laughs> I studied uh, in a Spanish country, my medical studies. And I uh, just want to congratulate you guys. Keep up the good work because I know how it is to be an ambassador in a foreign country. As you said, uh, Zama, Tuba, the, question you, the questions you had there, I had as well in Spain, Cuba, all those countries when they looked at me because I had to study Spanish first before my medical studies. They looked at me like, um, are you a really South African? Because that time I used to have those, you know, uh, Brazilian hair. They thought I'm coming from uh, Brazil or whatever because I used to have those friends that time. Then I said, no, I'm from South Africa. And they, were like, they said you walk barefooted, you stay on trees, you know. At some point, I said yes, that's true. And then when I came to South Africa, I made it sure I buy myself a video camera. I went to all these beautiful places, and I also went to the rural areas, you know, just to for them to see how is um, Africa and like my country, South Africa. After that. You know, they were looking at me because they were not, never told how is um, Africa and South Africa. And our own people from South Africa, they were changing themselves. Like, they were like, not Af being, they were not pride, having pride being an African. And in so much that what I did to try and introduce what we are doing now, I talked to the dean, I asked them to have African Day, where each and every person, every part of the Africa, to come with their, their culture and their dances so that we show them who we are. They enjoy them. Mexicans, they were enjoying that because our own problem is to identify who we are, our own, um, where we're coming from, uh, our own African pride. So it starts there, who we are, our integrity, have diplomacy and everything. So if we start with those little things and we come up there, when you're an old person, you will know how to say hi to your neighbor without being to, you have to be told to greet your own neighbor. Knowing those simple principles, then you go far. Thank you very much.
Uh, coming to the sorry to the last one. Uh, and to be given money in a foreign country without even taught how to use it, because I was coming from a poor family. People were misusing money because they were not taught how to deal with it, because it was something that just came like that. So even to be taught financial-wise, if you are a child coming from that background, knowing nothing, not like the same as the wife of those who have, who have been growing up, people having money at home. So that lack of education, mentorship, as they said, it's also a very important point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I, I, I trust that you've enjoyed these discussions as much as I have, um, and hopefully as much as the panelists have. So in closing, I would like to ask each one of you, uh, if you've got any closing comments, please, to talk about this. Um, and, uh, and that will be it for today. So we can talk about one thing, is that a lot of people say, a lot of young people say they don't have talent. And I would just say to them today that talent is the willingness to deliberately practice. Mm -hmm. It's a tribute to one of my founders, Mr. Bradford, who I admire for giving me this advice. Practice, 10,000 hours. If you want to do something, you're going to, you're going to do it. Just practice it. If I didn't practice English, I would be speaking it today. If I didn't practice teaching, I would be loving it today. So I would just encourage everyone to practice. Practice. Thank you very much. Francis. If you're a CEO out there, or if you're successful, or if you've made it, um, one thing I want to say is that it's Africa for Africans, and Africans should be the ones to solve their problem. If I go to a CEO and I request, and I'm like, this is an idea that we're thinking about, and you turn me down, you're not contributing to the development of this country. We need you people to support us, and if you support our issues, then Africa will move forward, as opposed to waiting for people out there to come and solve our problems for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just too brief. I think what I want is just to give you all the clear and listening to our decision making position. Um, I think we have to realize that a competitive Africa uh, and a growing Africa means nothing if those people, the people who are in rural areas, the people who are marginalized are not part of it. I mean, growth means nothing if it's not a shared growth. And then um, I just wanted to also say the, um, to people my own age, um, and I think I just want to say that I think we realize this is that, especially in Africa, if we don't make history, then history will make us. And I don't, I don't think that there's any margin left um, on this continent for that to happen again. I think to, this is something I say a lot, I tweet about it at Facebook, and I even blog about it every so often. And that is, as young people, we are not the future leaders of tomorrow, but we are the current leaders of today. And one only needs to look at um, young businesses that have thrived, that are led by young people. You see us rising up even in you know, the political world. We, we might not have as much power yet, so far as politics is concerned, but we are currently leading. And I think it's time as young people, we stop looking at ourselves as the next generation of leaders or we're leading the tomorrow. We're leading right now. We already have entrepreneurs who are sitting on this panel. We already have people who are saying they want to be teaching, and they are teaching. So the sooner we come to the realization that we are leading, the sooner the older generation comes to the realization that young people are leading, I think the faster we can um, accelerate as Africa and the easier it would be for us to work together. Well, three things. Innovation starts at home. There's a new project on its way. The power of the cell phone that will showcase the people of South Africa's story. With a cell phone, you can just go to the cleaning lady right next door and ask her, what is your story? And that will be showcased. It's on its way. Innovation starts at home. The next session, I'm really interested. Abdullah, please make sure that South Africa in BRICS, I still haven't had the opportunity to meet my peers in other African countries. We want to take our opportunities and we want to make the most of it ourselves. Please don't give it to the rest to do it for us. Good. Last thing, for my peers, don't, don't lose hope. It is going to be tough, but it is us that will have to make it happen, and we will. Thanks. Lastly, seeing as I was to speak about women, in the name of every girl child born today, in the name of every girl, in the name of every woman living today, it's time we harness all our talents and all our energy and all our knowledge and make Africa the winning continent it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa and the world's future. Thank you.